Well, good evening. Wow. So, John Mark just mentioned, I, uh, earlier, a week ago, two weeks ago, I knew what I was going to speak about tonight. And then I just didn't feel it today. And, and there was another thought that I had, like maybe a, uh, about four or five days ago. And I'm not feeling that one either. And uh, I was chatting uh, with, with Paula, actually, before, uh, right after worship practice and, and before uh, prayer. And I was like, in Jeremiah 20, verse 9, Jeremiah said, But if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. And so I've learned something about the voice of God. Like if I think that God's telling me something and I just kind of sit on it for a little bit, either it's going to just go away like it's no big deal, or... having a problem with the connection. I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> All right. So am I. I understand. <laughs> so either there's this, uh, it just kind of goes away, or there's this intensifying of this fire inside that's like, I've got to share this. And when it came to those two things that were on my heart before, it just kind of drifted away to where today I'm like, I don't think that's the word for tonight. And I've spent all day seeking the Lord, like, Lord, what do you want to do? What do you want to share? And, and so uh, during uh, prayer time, or I think it was actually a little before that maybe, but, but the Lord dropped a passage on my heart that, that did feel right. And I'm not entirely sure where we're going to go all the way with it, but uh, as I was sitting there going, boy, this is a little crazy during worship, Joe leaned over my shoulder and said, hey, Art, I feel like God's saying don't second guess yourself. Uh, what he gave you a little bit ago, it's like he called an audible and showed you something different. Go with that. <laughs> so this is how the prophetic works, right? You know? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for that. So let's go, in fact, before I even go there, I'm, I'm going to start with the verse that, that uh, is kind of a, I don't know, a popular verse for us here at Roots. It's 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. This is why we have house churches. Everybody's got something. Now, it would be really, uh, I don't know, I, I could just, uh, we could stop there and I could just let all of you do the rest of my sermon for me. But uh, I feel like God has something additional tonight. But that is why we have house churches. It's that when we come together, each of us is bringing something. You are the body of Christ each of you is a part. You each have a revelation of Jesus to bring to the mix. And so if it's just one person preaching, we're, we're only seeing one piece of the body, right? But when everybody shares, we're seeing a fuller revelation of Jesus. Now tonight, obviously in a room this big, if everybody shared, we'd be here all night. Encounter night just kind of isn't the context for that kind of ministry, except at the end, a lot of times we'll be ministering to each other. And even during worship, I saw people prophesying over each other. And you guys do it. You get it. Everybody's a minister. But here's the passage I want to kind of tie this into tonight. And like I said, we'll see where we're going with it. I'm, I'm on this journey, too. We're going to go to John 15. John 15, verse 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. Actually, let me pause there and, and jump back for a second. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. What's he talking about? He's saying this to the disciples, right? 
What does clean mean? This is, again, that vine dresser kind of language, right? It's like the father's the gardener. He's going to cut off every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it becomes even more fruitful. My um, uh, former pastor, his is, uh, next door neighbor used to grow hydroponic tomatoes. And uh, his kids would work there in the tomato greenhouse. And, and uh, they had this job of cutting off the suckers, the little curly Q vines that come off that aren't growing tomatoes. They're just, sap is being diverted to these extra little things, right? And when they cut those things off, now instead of the sap going down the little, you know, rabbit trails, it's all pumping into that fruit and making huge, monstrous tomatoes. He prunes us to make us more fruitful. And how does he prune us? He just said it with his word. That's good. There's something about the voice of the Lord that starts to cut off the stuff that doesn't belong. In fact, I wasn't even sure how this would fit in but I'll use it. <laughs> this came to me during worship, and I ran to the kitchen and found some uh, Ziploc bags. All right, you can, you can see through the, the Ziploc bag, right? Right? These are transparent, but if I stack up five of these, do you see me? What happened? I thought, I thought you could see through these. You know, uh, Exodus uh, 20, I think it's verse 3 in the Ten Commandments. God says, you shall have no other gods before me. What that ultimately ends up being is, like, if, if I have a God before him, like if, if Brad is representing God in this moment, and uh, I set something before him, there is now something between Brad's face and mine. Right? That command is for you to have nothing between your face and God's. And sometimes we look at little insignificant things in our lives and we're like, well, that's not like outright sin. I mean, you can see through that. <laughs> but there's all this stuff all stacked up. And as he speaks his word little by little, there's this pruning away of the stuff that doesn't bear fruit, a pruning away of the things that get in the way that are hiding his view until they're all gone. And he says, you're clean. Why? Because of the word I've spoken to you. If you feel like you've got stuff between your face and God's, what do you need? The word. You need the word. It's so simple. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 4. Remain in me as I also remain in you. We were just singing that. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Think about that for a second. You're a branch of the vine. If you cut the branch off the vine and set it out here on this uh, podium here, is it going to produce any fruit? No, because it's not the fruit of the branch. That's good. It's the fruit of the vine. It's not your fruit. That means it's not your effort. <laughs> it's Jesus. Come on. When you abide in him, his life by the power of the Holy Spirit is flowing through you to produce something. Mm. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Wow. <laughs> so am I a disciple of Jesus? Well... Is there fruit? 
And, and be honest with yourself. I don't say that in a condemning way. I say that to, to spur you on toward love and good works as the scriptures command. It's like, is, is there good fruit? What is fruit? Fruit is evidence of the life that's in the vine. It's something only Jesus can produce. So this isn't an invitation to strive in your own effort and be gooder. The question is, are you abiding in him so that he can produce his life through you? Is there anything between your face and his? <laughs> hmm. Verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. That, that verse sounds like his love is a constant, and I'm the one who decides whether to hang out there. Right? How often do we just, you know, start thinking these lies and getting into this place of, does God even see me? Where is he? You know, you go through difficult seasons. Everything seems to be falling apart. We just had three funerals this weekend for people attached somehow to our, our church family here, whether they attended here or someone very close to them attended here. And those are the ones I know about. Maybe there's others. But you know, it's like you can, you can get distracted by that stuff. And you can start to think, what happened? We were like, everything was going so great. There was this outpouring of the Spirit. And he didn't stop. His love never turned off. And we can get our eyes focused on the mess, or we can keep our eyes focused on him and be at rest there. What is 2 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 3, verse 18. It says, uh, as we behold his glory, we are transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. So as I behold him, I become like him. So is there anything between his face and mine? What am I looking at? As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Verse 10. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Oh. So how do I remain in his love? Keep his commands. I'm just reading the Bible here. <laughs> You know, there's a passage that says his commands are not burdensome. Right? A lot of times we hear words like this, like, keep my commands and then you'll remain in my love. And we start to think that it means Jesus is up there going, I'm only going to love you if you do the right thing. That's not it. The reality is his love is a constant. It's always there. It doesn't stop. But to remain in that place of experiencing his love, he is Lord. Right? He is Lord. And either I'm surrendered to him, which means I do what he says, or I'm not. And that's a me problem. Hmm. Verse 11, I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. He didn't tell you this so you can feel bad. He told you this so you can feel good. In other words, if you're sitting there going, oh man, I don't know if I've been obeying his commands. I don't know if I'm abiding in his love. Am I even a disciple? Guess what? Again, I'm not beating you up with this message. I am inviting you. I'm inviting you to a lifestyle that is like beyond anything you could imagine. I wouldn't trade this for the world. 
Verse 12, my command is this. Here's the command that we have to obey. Love each other as I have loved you. Okay, love each other, that part seemed easy, but then how? As I have loved you. How did he love us? He gave himself up, exactly. He hadn't even died yet when he said this. But what had he done? He had given up his place in heaven. Philippians 2. Jesus, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider his equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he humbled himself, taking the very nature of a servant, being found in human likeness, made himself obedient unto death, even death on a cross. That's the Jesus we serve. So if you want to love people like Jesus loved, it means you don't raise yourself up in their sight, you lower yourself. You do what he just did, which was he wrapped a towel around his waist and he washed his disciples' feet. He took the role of the lowest of the low servant. And he said, hey, do this for each other. (laughs) My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Hold on. I have in the past taken that verse out of its context and just said, oh, he calls me a friend, right? There's that song, I am a friend of God, right? And we, we sing it, and we're all excited and happy, but, but what does being a friend look like? What is that? You are my friends, verse 14, if you do what I command. And I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything I've learned from my father I've made known to you. In other words... <laughs> If all you do is slaving away, trying to do good stuff, but you're not communing with him, you're still missing out. (laughs) This is not about the doing as much as it is about the being. When you connect to him, when 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 you invest in your friendship with him, all the doing flows out of that. It's easy to do something that you are. (laughs) We've talked about that many times. Hmm. Verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Hold on. Fruit of the branch? No, fruit of the vine. So it's the vine's fruit. Jesus is the vine. And he chose you and appointed you to go bear his fruit. That means Jesus has surrendered his own fruitfulness to the context of union with you. That's a terrifying thought. I mean, I have to believe that Jesus believes he will be more fruitful by producing fruit through you than if he just stayed here running around the towns and villages around Jerusalem, laying hands on people and preaching sermons. (sighs) There's something greater has happened. He's put his spirit in you. It's for a purpose. It's to do something, right? So it's like, oh, I just need need to experience God's love. Yes, yes, you do. And as soon as you do, what do you do to stay there? You obey his commands because that's how you remain in his love. (laughs) You didn't choose him. He chose you. 
and he appointed you to go and bear fruit, his fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in his name, he'll give you. Verse 17, this is my command, love each other. He reiterates it. I want to jump over to James. Here we go. And it's going to be chapter three. No, yeah, chapter, chapter two. We'll start in two, verses 14 to 26. James 2, 14 to 26. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Let me, let me use words that we're more used to using today. I'll pray for you. We're cheering you on. Good, good. Please keep praying for people and cheering people on. But when someone has a need, they need more than prayers and cheering, right? <laughs> like it seems to me sometimes when Jesus invites us to pray, he's inviting us to do. Like that time when he said, uh, uh, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. Go, I'm sending you like lambs among wolves. Wait a minute here. You didn't even give me a chance to pray it yet. And already you're sending me. Yes, pray for them. But if you can do something, do something. Right? Amen. Verse 16, if one, if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by, by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good, even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. There's that friend again. How do you get to be a friend of God? Obedience. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Mm. You abide in his love, you become his friend through obedience. But he also said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Let that one bake in your noodle for a while. I don't know. I just mixed some metaphors. I don't know how that works. <laughs> how do you bake something in a noodle? Okay. Ravioli. Make a ravioli out of that one. <laughs> lasagna. That's good. Did you know if you have one lasagna and you put another lasagna on top, you still only have one lasagna? Sorry. If you get nothing else out of tonight, it's that. Think about that for a second. It's like I can't obey him without him. It's his fruit, not mine. So I have to have faith in him in order to obey him. So yeah, faith necessary, got to come first. Then I obey him. And as I obey him, what am I doing? I'm abiding in his love. I'm developing a friendship with God where I know his heart and I'm, I'm in union with his heart because I'm doing what he does. Right? I, I've gotten the, the junk out of the way between my face and his so that I can behold his glory and be transformed into his image so that when people see me, they see him. So if my life doesn't look like Jesus, something's got to give. I can't just walk around saying, you know, oh, I'm good. 
or singing I'm a friend of God or whatever it is to like give myself a pep talk and there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yes, if you're in Christ Jesus, are you in him? For real. If I'm in him, there's going to be his fruit. And I hope that's a scary statement. I hope we take that seriously enough to to examine ourselves and say, Lord, am I really united to you? Have I died to myself to let the Spirit of God live in me? Or am I just living for myself and singing nice songs and going to church so I can hear all this stuff about identity in Christ and somehow convince myself it's true of me? Come on. If, it is, if his identity has become your identity, live it. It's that simple. And so how do you know if his identity has become your identity? Well, do you believe you've died with him? Have you asked him to raise you to new life? Have you confessed with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart, he's raised from the dead? Okay, then I believe his identity is my identity. Now what? Let's remain in his love. Let's foster that friendship. Let's get out and obey. Let's do the things he told us to do, right? Whew. Oh, Lord, help me. Let's uh, actually jump one chapter ahead here in James, chapter 3, verse 13 to 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. Deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. I often talk about, like, uh, we, we've, we've kind of mixed up this word humility. I think, uh, I think it was, it might have been, I, I could have my quoting wrong. I should have prepped my sermon. But <laughs> uh, I think it was C.S. Lewis who said something to the effect of humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less, right? And so it's this idea of I, I don't have to, like, beat myself up and think I'm some nasty evil worm in order to be humble. In fact, I would argue that's the opposite of humility, Why? Romans 12 says, Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Okay. Not more highly than you ought. It doesn't say don't think of yourselves highly. Just not more highly than you ought. I ought to think of myself as a son of God seated on the throne with Jesus at the right hand of the Father. That's what Scripture says. Why am I going there? Well, for one thing, the word prunes us. But faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, right? So if I'm supposed to think of myself in accordance with the measure of faith God's given me, then I have to think of myself according to this, right? So it says these things about me. We've talked about them many times. I'm a new creation. I'm, I'm a, the old is gone. The new is here. I'm part of a nation of priests and kings. I'm a child of God. I'm, I'm seated on the throne with Christ, right? All these things are true of me if I'm in Christ. Now, let him show it by his good deeds that come from humility, that comes from wisdom, or done in humility. So what is humility? Humility is, I know who I am, and I serve you anyway. Humility is Jesus knowing he is the Son of God and washing his disciples' feet. You know, the Bible says that Moses was the most humble man who ever lived. You know who wrote that book of the Bible? Moses. Moses. If God says, Moses, you're the most humble man who ever lived, and he goes, no, 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 I'm, I'm so prideful, I'm a worm, I don't deserve that, that's Moses exalting his opinion of himself above God's opinion. I'd call that pride. But if God says, you're the most humble man who ever lived, and you just, okay, Moses was the most humble man who ever lived, guess what? He just surrendered his opinion of himself to God's opinion. And that's humility. You see? So... Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. 
But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Hold the phone. Who would ever boast about having bitter envy or selfish ambition? Guess what? Anytime you say something like, um, uh, I just, you know, I, I got this idea. It was just, uh, I, I felt like it was just something I, I, I had been always wanted and I got out there and I, I muscled through and I made it happen. Like, you know, what are we boasting in? Our own ambition, our own ability. <laughs> Apart from me, Jesus, you can do nothing. So what does real humility look like in that moment? It's like, I really felt like the Lord asked me to do something that's way bigger than me. And I just said yes to the little things he was asking of me, and somehow he pulled it together. He did this wild, crazy thing through me I don't understand fully. I mean, I, I personally feel this when I look at all of you. Because I just had a bunch of young adults meeting in my living room 10 years ago, like, you know, 15, 20 young adults, and now there's like 300 of y'all in 13 house churches all over Metro Detroit. And I know that's not just because I'm amazing. I know that it's because Jesus is amazing and he lives in you and he's doing these things through you and all these testimonies we heard earlier. It's because of what he's doing in and through you. Like, I, I, I feel like I'm just kind of like caught along for the ride. What I did was embarrassingly small. That was my contribution. Meet every week with a bunch of young adults. And y'all just ran with it. (laughs) Wow. So he says, if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such quote unquote wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Whoa. Anything that is selfish ambition Bitter envy, that's, uh, and that can happen in church stuff. Those people got up, they shared their testimonies, and oh man, you know, I wish that John Mark gave me a chance to get up to the microphone, because if they could have heard my testimony, everybody would be impressed with me. Bitter envy. Earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Crucify it. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome, John Mark. <laughs> he said, I don't read my emails anyways. <laughs> Verse 16, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. You know, one of the things I love about our house churches is the unity and the fellowship and the people getting together and loving each other and just letting each other share and like, it's awesome. Awesome. Like, one of the phrases I frequently say, uh, not every single week, but fairly frequently, I'll say, you know, what God has spoken to you is more important to me than what God has spoken to me. Why? Because I already know what he spoke to me. Right? And so if I want to be discipled by Jesus, and the body of Jesus is sitting in my living room, I'm probably not going to talk very much. I think the only thing I want to say is whatever he wants to say through me. Because when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a tongue, an interpretation, a revelation, and everything must be done so the church can be built up. You see? When you get into house church, don't be thinking, what is the thing that that I can say that will hint to everybody that I'm a good Christian and I've been reading my Bible even though I haven't this week? Yeah. That's just... Selfish ambition, vain conceit, that's, that's bitter envy, that's wanting to measure up to everybody else and trying to be good enough. Don't even bother with that. Don't waste your own breath. <laughs> Instead, let's think, Jesus, is there anything you want to speak through me here, now? 
I'm not basing that on how much Bible I read or how much prayer I spent. You know, it's, it's right now in this moment, I'm going to connect with you. I'm not going to focus on whether I qualify based on my performance. I'm going to focus on you and your performance. I'm going to let whatever scriptures and whatever presentations of your word happen in this meeting cleanse me of all the stuff that's been getting in the way. I'm going to abide in your love and, and remain in you. I'm, I'm going to, you know, everything changes. I get a fresh start. And you just trust him. And if he speaks to you something, share it. It's going to be awesome. Sometimes you'll feel like I did. Well, I had this thing that was rolling around in my head for a couple weeks, but I don't know if that's for tonight. It's not like a fire shut up in my bones. Right? And so it's like, I don't really need to share that. If I share that, I'm, uh, you know, it, it might be good, but it's not God. <laughs> hmm. Verse 17, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Whoa. Wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. Are my motives pure? Am I sharing this in love? Am I sharing it so Jesus is seen or so I'm seen? <laughs> it's peace loving. Am I just saying this to stir up something? I mean, I've, I've experienced this and I mean, it was public. I'm, I won't name names, but uh, there was a time in a house church meeting that there were a couple people who were kind of having a spat outside the house church meeting and in the meeting, one of them said, Hey, uh, so what do you do if someone hypothetically does X, Y, Z? They were just passive aggressively trying to throw the other person under the bus. And I just called him out on it. I said, the way you asked that question boxes me into a corner of saying something that makes you look right. But I know the reason you're asking the question is because of the little tiff you've got going on here. And I'm just not going to cater to that. <laughs> Yeah, come on. Is it peace loving? If you got a beef with somebody, meet with them privately. Amen. You don't need to throw them under a bus. Yeah. <laughs> then it's peace loving. It's considerate. That means the things I'm going to share in house church. I'm I'm trying to like benefit everybody. You know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna use vocabulary for the least common denominator in the room. You know, like like who's if I'm, if I'm talking in crazy Christianese, you know, the words that only Christians know, but outsiders don't. And then there's a newcomer who's like, what is righteous? What is, you know, what do those words even mean? I need to help them. So I want to be considerate. That's wisdom. That's godly wisdom. It's full of mercy. Full of mercy. Mercy helps somebody. Mercy does something to lift somebody up out of a pit. Mercy brings others up to where we are. Hmm. That's what Jesus did when he had mercy on you. And it's full of good fruit, which again is a revelation of Jesus. It's impartial and it's sincere. Verse 18, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Well, there you go. I mostly let the Bible talk for me tonight. But do you see it? I, I feel like what just kind of, uh, 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 what should I say, took shape here tonight. There's, there's a few key points. One is, I don't want anything between my face and God's. And as I get things out of the way, Little by little, I see him more and more clearly until suddenly we're face to face. What are the things that need to get out of my life? Well, I'll tell you this, it's anything that doesn't look like Jesus. And so how do I get those things out of my life? 
I can't move these things. Apart from him, I can do nothing. So how do I get cleansed? Do you remember? The word. You got it. So I'm going to read the scriptures. I'm going to you know, go to house church and hear what God's speaking through others. I'm going to listen in my own prayer time for God to speak to me. Because every time the Lord speaks, something is breaking off of my life. And it's getting out of the way so that I can behold his glory and become more like him. And the more I'm like him, the more an an experience with me becomes an experience with him. Anything of Jesus that you see in my life is Jesus. Anything that doesn't look like him, that's the part of me that still needs to die. Right? Does your language look like him? Do your hobbies look like him? I mean, he was a carpenter. He, you don't have to all be carpenters, you know, but like, like you, can, you can do stuff. There's room for recreation. Fishing. Fishing. There you go. He's good at that too. Yeah. Come on. Does it look like him? Does the way you treat your, your parents, your kids, your spouse your neighbors, your coworkers, people in church, does it look like him? Because if you're loving, if you obey his command to love, you'll be his friend. There's no better place to be. Father, I pray that you would teach us to love. Lord, I feel like, uh, like a word like this invites us to just completely surrender. <laughs> we can't do it in our own strength. We can't be good enough. We can't love enough. We're not creative enough or smart enough, gifted enough. The greatest traits among us are still inferior compared to you. And so, Lord, we put it all on the cross. We consider it dead. Holy Spirit, would you show us anything in our lives that's between our face and the Father? is inviting you into friendship today. (laughs) Those of you who are already there, you're just rejoicing that everybody else gets to come along. (laughs) But he's inviting you all into friendship. It starts with simple faith. It starts with his voice to us, welcoming us into relationship. And we trust him. We believe that he has done the work on the cross, that it is finished. We put all of our faith and confidence in his work, not our own. And suddenly there's this cascade of love out of heaven where he wraps you in himself and he says, here's a touch of my love. And I feel in my spirit that there are many of us tonight, you've had many, many encounters with God's love, but you struggle to remain in that place. Maybe it was just one of these last few encounter nights we've had and just the outpouring of the spirit that's been happening among us after these 
these meetings, it's, it's been awesome. And you encounter his love and you just are like, wow, God is so awesome. And maybe two, three, four days later, you're like, is he still with me? I want you to remain in his love. It's not about getting a fresh dose at another meeting. It's about obeying him. Because if you obey, you remain. <laughs> Some of you may be thinking, wow, I wish I knew what God wanted me to do. <laughs> Jesus said it. Love like I've loved you. That's it. You don't need to have some massive ministry. <laughs> Paul said, if I've got faith that can move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I surrender my body to the flames so I can boast, I, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Love is the whole point. And it's love that looks like Jesus' love. Love that loves enemies. Love that forgives people before they deserve it, before they repent. Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. That kind of love. Love that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So that person in your work or your household or your neighborhood or school or whatever that you just can't stand, <laughs> that you're like, man, I wish God would make them easier to love. How about you go to the cross before they do? Jesus, we surrender. <laughs> we surrender. Teach us to love. As the fruit of love pours out of you, he will keep providing more of that sap, more of his life to flow through you. And you will bear much fruit. You know, the thing about fruit is it's not to nourish the vine, it's to nourish others. <laughs> Let's surrender all selfish ambition, all bitter envy, all self-centeredness of any kind. Let's surrender it to the cross. Lord, if there's anything in any of us, myself included, if there's anything that is self-focused, self-centered, Lord, we offer it to you. <laughs> Teach us, Lord, not to seek the seat of honor. Teach us to honor others above ourselves. Jesus, thank you for inviting us to be your friends. I just feel led for us to take a little bit of time here 
at this point, I'll say we're officially done, and if you have to go, don't, don't feel bad. But uh, I would encourage each of you to, to take at least a moment, take as much time as you need to seek the Lord and say, Lord, would you show me anything, anything that doesn't look like Jesus? I want you to have it all. Let his presence wash over you. Let him remind you of, your, of his love for you. Just behold him. Just behold him.
If you want to come to the front here and pray, I'll come around and pray for you. I know there's others who will as well. You know, his word prunes us. And if any of you feel like you've got a prophetic word for someone, I want you to feel free to share it. And my encouragement to everyone who hears a prophetic word from somebody, judge it like the scriptures say. Just because someone says, I feel like God's saying this doesn't mean he actually is. Weigh it, take it to the Lord, and see if it's true. You'll know. But let's seek his face. Let's love each other. Feel free to stay as late as you want. John Mark will keep leading us. And let's, just, let's just let him love us. We love because he first loved us. Thanks, Jesus.